Welcome to the Alfalfa in the South online workshop series. I'm Dr. Jennifer Tucker with the University of Georgia. Today I'm going to be providing a quick review of recent research that we've been conducting in Tifton, Georgia. My research program began in 2016 at the UGA Tifton campus. I conduct produ producer-driven applied research projects that help to develop best management practices, specifically looking at alfalfa and Bermuda grass mixtures and their management by our producers. Before we get into talking about the data and reviewing some of the research projects that we've conducted, let's talk a little bit about the weather. As you can see from the past, in the past five years looking at the temperatures in Tifton, they haven't really varied that much from the normal. So we've had that warmer temperatures that we've continued throughout those hot summer months and nothing's really off from the expectations of temperature. However, when we start to look at that precipitation, we see a very different story. If we look at 2016, we started off very wet and then we turned off pretty dry in those, that May time period. In 2017, we had what we would consider a more normal time period or norm, more normal precipitation during that time period of active growth of our forages. 2018, if anybody remembers, was a very, very wet year uh, with a lot of impacts from hurricanes. And then 2019, our most recent year, was riddled with drought. As you can see, uh, we only really had significant rainfall in that June time period, and it's as if the rain shut off throughout the rest of the year. We need to keep this in mind as we look through uh, the data and the research, as we know that environmental impacts really uh, affect our, our forage production. So the first project that I implemented uh, when arriving in Tifton in 2016 was looking at alfalfa and Bermuda grass mixtures in baleage production. This was a comparison of the yield and quality of Tifton 85 Bermuda grass to Tifton 85 Bermuda grass with Bulldog 805 alfalfa, all of this harvested as baleage. This was part of Dr. Taylor Hendricks' PhD project and supported by the Georgia Beef Cattle Commodity Commission. Now, one of the questions that we get from lots of producers after presenting our data is will alfalfa work in other Bermuda grasses other than Tifton 85? Uh, the real interesting part of this is we had already seen a lot of success with alfalfa and Bermuda grass varieties uh, of all kinds of varieties, and we hadn't seen a lot of work with the Tifton 85, and we were concerned with the robust growth of that Tifton 85 that the alfalfa would not compete. However, we are proud to say that uh, Tifton 85 does compare uh, very well and match very well with our Bermuda grass mixtures or alfalfa alpha Bermuda grass mixtures. Now, one of the reasons that we wanted to look at baleage production is baleage can be a game changer for our producers in the southeast. If you uh, live here, you understand that in the early spring months, there's a lot of rainfall. Uh, there's it's very hard to get those multiple days of dry weather to really successfully produce dry production, dry hay production. Uh, by utilizing baleage technology, we can minimize that weather factor, which allows it to be easier for us to maintain that harvest interval that we're looking for to get that timely harvest and that higher quality forage product. Another advantage to baleage production is uh, harvesting at a higher moisture or baling at a higher moisture allows for better leaf retention of our forages, especially when we're working with a delicate forage like alfalfa, which when dried out really has a tend a tendency to shatter on those leaves. We established the uh, Bulldog 805 alfalfa into an existing Tifton 85 Bermuda grass hay field uh, in February of 2016. Now you will notice that that does not follow with our recommendation of a fall harvest. Uh, we do re usually recommend planting in that October time period. However, weather uh, and other factors forced us to go with a spring harvest and it did have an impact on uh, our first year establishment. Uh, we harvested at around 20 pounds an acre uh, seed on a 14 inch row spacing. Now we do recommend that 14 inch row spacing uh, to allow for successful competitiveness of both the alfalfa and Bermuda grass um, stands. Uh, when, you when you plant on that seven inch row spacing, we really start to see a lot of shading effects of that alfalfa and to start to have a, a, a negative impact on that Bermuda grass component that we do want to see in our stand. In this comparison, we used Tifton 85 Bermuda grass where we applied commercial nitrogen uh, four times throughout the season following what our um, 
hay recommendations are for Tipton 85 Bermuda grass, or we had our Tipton 85 and alfalfa mixtures, which we did not apply nitrogen uh, throughout the evaluation as we expect the alfalfa to provide that nitrogen component for growth. Now, when we get into the harvest management, uh, we, after that first year, so in that first year of establishment, we do recommend that you harvest that first cutting at a 25% or later bloom stage. Uh, that's just to really allow for root growth, uh, carbohydrate reserves, and to really get that alfalfa uh, component to the best advantage that it has to be strong. After that, all of our harvest occurred at the 10% bloom stage, and we harvested on a 28 to 35 day interval throughout the three years of the evaluation. Uh, once the Bermuda grass uh, treatments broke dormancy, we then also maintained that 28 to 35 day harvest interval uh, for the Bermuda grass only treatments. Right before harvesting, we would mow in the evening at about 6 p.m., uh, the night before we planted to bale, rake and bale this product. Uh, the reason we did an evening cut is because those sugars accumulate in that forage throughout the day. Uh, if we think about how photosynthesis works, uh, and as those sugars are accumulating up into the plant, that's gonna help uh, higher sugars, it's gonna help with that fermentation process. And so we do cut the evening before, uh, the next morning, we begin uh, by doing a microwave test uh, to test moisture of that forage. And once we reach that target of 55% moisture, uh, we're, we raked and baled that, that, that forage product. We would then move those bales immediately to an individual bale wrapper, uh, and we would wrap those bales. And usually this occurred within a four hour time period, but definitely all within one day. Now, when we think about alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures, you know, in a perfect world, you would have 50% of both uh, components and nothing else in the stand. But the reality is, is that we are dealing with a cool season and a warm season forage. And so what you look for is an ebb and flow relationship of these two, uh, two species together. And that's really, that is what we saw. So when we start to look at the botanical composition of these stands, uh, we can see that in that 2016 time period, that that alfalfa component uh, was there, but it wasn't very strong. Now, again, this is linked to having a February time planting. And so it was still in the establishment phase during that first year. Uh, but we can also see that we had some significant weed presence uh, in 2016. Uh, and that was really due to some of that drought uh, and lack of rain that we had in those summer months. Uh, however, the weed present uh, was predominantly crabgrass, which is a high quality forage to, to uh, add into that mixture. So it really didn't affect our nutritive value of our product. However, when we looked into 2017, uh, you can see that we started to have that ebb and flow relationship. Uh, in those early months when Bermuda grass was still dormant, uh, we did have that dominance of alfalfa in that March and April time period. And then we also started to have uh, an extra cutting in that October time period uh, with, with that alfalfa, and as well as maintaining a very strong stand. And then this continued into 2018, and we see uh, that we really have a lot of that alfalfa that we're, uh, that we're looking for and we're still having pretty strong alfalfa stands in those early months. Uh, the other caveat is that after we got out of that establishment year of 2016, we were able to maintain a greater than 30% um, stand of alfalfa. Uh, and if you're looking at grazing research or, or pasture productivity, uh, you're thinking about uh, incorporating a legume, we recommend having a 30% or greater stand of legume to counteract that um, or to, to make up for that uh, nitrogen component as you aren't applying commercial nitrogen to these treatments. Uh, so just looking really quickly at an overview of the baleage data, uh, we did find after the three years of the evaluation that the advantage really was to that mixture. Uh, by half in incorporating alfalfa into the Bermuda grass, we were able to increase the number of harvests, having on average seven harvests uh, throughout uh, the growing season. And so you were uh, almost doubling the number of harvests that you would be getting off of that unit of land. Of course, that then uh, correlates to 
uh, increase in the tonnage per acre produced. And so you were able to increase the overall tons per acre again on that unit of land. And once we got out of that 2016 uh, season and, and into this, the second and third year of the evaluation, you really started to see that separation in that quality uh, with greater quality of crude protein, TDN, and RFQ uh, for those Tipton 85 and alfalfa um, mixtures compared to the Tipton 85 Bermuda grass alone. And for this reason, uh, then we, we believe that the incorporation of alfalfa into your Bermuda grass can be a successful uh, approach to improving uh, yield and quality on that single unit of land. Now, a question that we get from a lot of producers is how long is alfalfa going to last? And, and particularly in this project, it's in a baleage uh, production system. And so while the baleage uh, evaluation itself was from 2016 to 2018, we are continuing to harvest these plots in baleage production. Uh, and we, we do have, and we are continuing them out until we believe that the stand is uh, no longer a viable option. And so we're very curious to see uh, how long this is going to last. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we, we continue harvesting these baleage plots, but another question that we got from producers uh, is what about another legume option other than alfalfa? You know, can this, uh, this system be successful with maybe a clover option? And so for us, we decided to use red clover. Uh, Bardura red clover will grow uh, can grow much into the summer months, and we've, we've been pleased to see the production of that, that red clover. Uh, while it is a biennial uh, forage, it does act as much like an annual, so it does require establishment each year, uh, but really just looking at the yield and quality comparisons of the two. And so we took those Tifton 85 Bermuda grass only plots, and we interseeded them with, out, uh, with uh, Bardura red clover. Um, in the fall of 2019 and 2020. And so we only have some preliminary data uh, to share for that. Uh, but looking at last year's production, uh, we, we did see that you did get a higher tonnage per acre uh, if you were utilizing an alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture in comparison to a red clover Bermuda grass mixture. However, 2019 is a hard year to do a comparison on. As you can see, we only were able to harvest the months of March through August. Uh, once August hit, uh, we were in that severe drought and we really didn't recover from that uh, for the remainder of the season until our next cutting in March of 2020. So we are gonna continue this out for a second year, as well as run quality analysis by uh, each harvest to, to really see what the comparison is and, and to answer that, uh, that significant producer question of, you know, can red clover or another clover option uh, work successfully uh, in this, this mixture with Bermuda grass. So we're very excited to see what those results are. Now, a, a large focus of my uh, research program is doing uh, grazing research and, um, you know, trying to figure out all the different applications of these alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures. And so we had, we did implement a two year grazing evaluation where we were utilizing alfalfa as a nitrogen source within a grazing system. In this comparison, we had Tipton 85 Bermuda grass pastures that we uh, either applied no nitrogen or applied couple, uh, supplemented uh, nitrogen, or we had alfalfa Bermuda grass uh, and grazed by stalker steers. Uh, for this evaluation, we have uh, established Bulldog 805 alfalfa in October of 2017. We did plant this on a seven inch row spacing. However, for future evaluations, we are gonna use that 14 inch row spacing uh, as we really uh, get, uh, see a decrease in the shading effects and, and uh, competitive advantage for both species on that 14 inch row spacing. Our Bermuda grass treatments that received nitrogen received 80 pounds an acre of calcium, uh, calcium ammonium nitrate, which was split applied twice per year, uh, per season. Uh, and then uh, at least once throughout the growing season, uh, when we started to see a lot of uh, excess weed material or uh, overgrown material that animals were selectively grazing around, we did do a vegetative reset uh, with mechanical mowing. Uh, for this evaluation, we used four to five weight stalker steers, and we rotationally grazed two acre paddocks that were split into three sections, and each section was grazed for a seven to 10 day rotation, uh, which would allow for about a 14 to 20 day rest period per section. 
Another interesting component of this evaluation is we used a completely temporary system. And so we were using a lot of that grazing technology that we recommend to our producers. And as you can see uh, in the top corner picture, we have our different paddocks that are separated using uh, temporary fencing technology. We also had our waterers on sleds. To, so each time that we moved the animals, we moved our waterers into each new section, our mineral feeders, uh, as well as uh, temporary uh, shade structures were, were moved for each section. And so, uh, you know, we had, we were doing true rotation or two, true intensive management of this evaluation. Looking at our total days of grazing, um, looking at year one, as you remember, 2018 was a very wet year and 2019 or year two was a very dry year. And so as we look across through there, uh, we began grazing in May of each year. Uh, but in year one, we were able to get 122 actual days of grazing. And in year two, we were only able to get 87 days of grazing doing, due to that drought, or that excessive drought that we had in 2019. Uh, when we look at our comparisons, we did do this by periods or, or by the different months because we uh, started to see that, that there wasn't a really big difference in our average daily gain uh, other than those early months and then that later time period uh, in that 2018. But there's really not a lot of difference when you look at the average daily gain. However, for this evaluation, we used put and take stocking. Uh, so we were able to add more animals to the evaluation uh, uh, to help to control the forage allowance or maintain forage allowance across the three treatments. And so that's when we really started to see that big difference. And looking at the gain per acre, we saw an improved gain per acre uh, when utilizing alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures compared to our Bermuda grass only treatments. And then really significantly, we started to look at that stocking rate because we had a much higher stocking uh, on those Bermuda grass uh, and alfalfa treatments. And so looking at the average seasonal gain, uh, it was significantly greater um, on those Bermuda grass and alfalfa treatments. And so what this translates to is the ability to um, stock more animals or produce more pounds uh, of product per acre, uh, which, is, which is significant um, when looking at southeastern forage production systems. And so for this, again, we said that the advantage went to the mixture. Uh, and we conclude that alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures are a viable option for our Southeaster stalker cattle producers, especially those that might be looking for uh, reduced dependence on synthetic nitrogen sources. However, we did notice that the rest periods really were not long enough to sustain the forage productivity and the animal performance during those drought years. And so we do need to have some adjustment to what those uh, rest periods or grazing recommendations are. So that led to a set, another study that was going on simultaneously with this grazing evaluation. Uh, this was a, a USDA NEFA supported project with the University of Florida, Auburn University, and the University of Georgia, where we were uh, working to develop grazing recommendations and on-farm decision tools for management of these alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures uh, in the Southeast. Uh, the goal of this project was to look at differences of combined harvest height and harvest frequency to provide the best grazing recommendations uh, for optimum forage production. And so if we think about that uh, and, you, and you consider what we, we're looking at the mock curve here, we're not looking for the opportunity of greatest yield total or the opportunity uh, of, of greatest quality, but we're actually looking for what that optimum is or how can we best efficiently, most efficiently utilize these systems. And so by focusing on the com combination of both stubble height as well as the rest period or the harvest frequency, we're hoping to be able to figure out what that optimum is in terms of yield quality as well as stand persistence. Uh, the data that we're going to be presenting today is from four of our locations in Georgia and Alabama. We had two northern locations, Crossville, Alabama and Watkinsville, Georgia, that were interseeded with Bulldog 505 alfalfa. And then we have our two southern locations when Shorter, Alabama and Tifton, Georgia, uh, interseeded with Bulldog 805 alfalfa. And all of these were uh, evaluated for combinations of harvest height and harvest frequency of two, four, or six inches and two, four, or six weeks. 
Now, if we look at the botanical composition really quickly of the, uh, the northern locations with that Bulldog 505, we can see that we had a successful establishment of alfalfa in those locations. And early on, we do have a significant contribution of alfalfa. However, we start to see that the alfalfa component uh, midway through, and especially in, those two, in that two week time period, uh, starts to significantly decrease. And by the late part of the season, uh, we saw that there was essentially no alfalfa in almost all of our treatments. Uh, and unfortunately, we did only get one year of data from our cross Alabama and Watkinsville, Georgia locations. If we talk about the weather, uh, we, we have to consider the fact that uh, in that late fall and winter time period, we had a very wet, very cold winter, uh, and alfalfa does not like to have uh, a wet feed. And so we do think that that contributed to the stand, um, stand persistence of that alfalfa component. However, we were able to run a linear regression to determine what that optimum point is. And that's what we're, we're really looking for is what is that target point where harvest height uh, and harvest frequency cross to optimize our forage yield. And so from our 505 locations, we determined that that was at four weeks and four inches. And so that, that would be uh, the recommendation. However, again, we only got one year of data in this location. But when we started to look at our southern location at our Bulldog 805, we, we started to really get some, uh, some good data and some strong data. And we see again that we had a significant alfalfa component early in the season. We started to get into those, uh, those warm summer months and we start to see a decrease in the alfalfa. Uh, late in the season, again, that two week harvest is just too, even at any height, is just too frequent uh, for those stands. However, going into our next year after, so this was uh, late in the season, late fall, and we allowed for rest until um, that spring time period, we really see that that alfalfa component starts to come back pretty strong. Uh, and again, those two week harvests uh, start to be detrimental on that stand, uh, but we start to see a really good strong stand of alfalfa and Bermuda grass mixtures. And then again, looking for that optimum time period, uh, this is again two years of data, and look at that harvest height and that, and that harvest frequency and uh, that optimum time period for forage yield. Uh, it's again at that four week, four inch height. And so both, uh, both locations confirm that allowing that 28 to 30 days of rest that, that we recommend really is gonna get us the, to that optimum stand persistence uh, and that optimum quality. If we started just, in, uh, just talking about the, the quality and looking at the relative forage quality, and this is just from our, our 805 locations in the Southern uh, southern locations over the two years of data, uh, but you really start to see just um, a separation again at that two week time period um, and then that six week 15 uh, centimeters. So this would be the effects of overgrazing versus undergrazing even. And, and although you have more uh, alfalfa presence still in those six week um, plots, we do see that that is stimmier, uh, more mature material, and that does have an impact on our overall quality. And so uh, we feel pretty confident in our four week, four inch uh, recommendation for optimization of that stand. Uh, just to give a better visual, I know a lot of data and numbers uh, doesn't really tell you a lot. So we, we took these pictures uh, of a single four inch, four week plot um, throughout the study. And so September of 2018 was the end of our first year at our Tipton location. However, in January, when we went back, we really started to see that alfalfa component coming back uh, very strong. Although we, in September, we, we thought we'd, we'd taken it all out. Uh, in May, you see that there's a, there's a significant amount of alfalfa as well as that winter weed, uh, annual ryegrass, uh, which is a, still a high quality forage. And so in pasture, uh, you could still graze that, that for pretty successfully. And then at the end of our season, um, our, our harvest season in 2019, again, you see that good mix of alfalfa and Bermuda grass that you're looking at at those four week, uh, four inch plots. And so we've been, uh, we, we feel pretty confident in these evaluations. Um, and, and the conclusion that, you know, giving, allowing for that full 28 to 30 days of rest is really gonna help to optimize that yield and, and that quality. Uh, and as we saw from, uh, the grazing study that the three weeks just really wasn't long enough. So what then is our next step? So um, we have 
submitted and successfully received funding for an, another alfalfa, USDA NEFA alfalfa system and alfalfa, uh, alfalfa seed and alfalfa forage systems grant. And so we're looking to implement a project uh, looking at different forage system management strategies and developing those best management strategies, as well as looking at uh, some of the social impacts uh, and, and concepts for expanding uh, alfalfa into the Southern Forage Livestock um, operations. And this again is a project with the University of Georgia, Auburn University, and the University of Florida. So the objectives are to evaluate the use of different alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures simultaneously in different varied use systems. And this will be in two locations, in Georgia and in Alabama. We're also working to develop an economic analysis, analysis and to expand on our economic tools that are available uh, to help producers make uh, more informed management decisions for their own operation. And then another interesting thing that we're doing is uh, we're trying to identify what the barriers are to the adoption of alfalfa in the southeast among our stakeholders. And so we really uh, we really need some some input there to determine, uh, you know, what really are the challenges of the barriers keeping uh, producers from establishing alfalfa. Just to kind of show you what we're, we're looking at uh, from the varied use systems, uh, we are implementing three different treatments. Uh, and these are all simultaneous right next to each other so we can see side-by-side -side comparisons of the different management strategies and so we are looking at a cut system which would be harvesting as hay or baleage throughout the entire three years of the project uh, and no grazing on those the uh, those particular paddocks. Uh, then we have our gray system where we only utilize grazing after that first clean off cut um, for that first year in that first year of establishment. Uh, and we are going to utilize rotational grazing. And then our cut and gray system. And in the cut and gray system, we are going to utilize both uh, harvest management through baleage production as well as grazing. And so from this, we believe that we can develop a uh, true best management practices as well as expectations for our producers under the varied uh, use management systems. But to do all of this, we need your help. And so we are developing a producer survey uh, to determine what the barriers are to alfalfa adoption. And so I'm hopeful that you will be uh, willing to answer these questions and be very open with us because we we're, we're, we really want to know uh, what those barriers are. And we're also looking to do some producer on-farm research collaborations. And so if you have an interest in doing that, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself or Dr. Kim Mullinex. And as we are planning to establish um, some locations in, in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida as well. We do have some additional resources. Uh, you can find webinars, previous webinars from 2018 and 2019 on the southeastcattleadvisor.com website as well as our full alfalfa in the, uh, mixing it up with alfalfa in the south workshop conducted at the American Forage and Grassland Council uh, meeting in 2020 in South Carolina and that's available at that YouTube link. If you are considering planting alfalfa, we have an alfalfa and Bermuda grass checklist. Uh, you can download this off of the southeastcattleadvisor.com webpage. Uh, and this is a good place to just start if you're considering alfalfa uh, integration into your system. And so, you know, kind of go through this checklist and make sure that you, you mark all the boxes or to determine what barriers might be uh, for you not establishing in the upcoming season. And so with that, I thank you for your time. Uh, and we are very excited about the potential for alfalfa integration and expansion in the Southeast, uh, as well as by, uh, providing practical and applicable uh, research data and information for our producers. Uh, if you have any question, my contact questions, my contact information is available there on that webpage. Uh, and with that, I will uh, thank you for your time.